Well, at both the 8.30 and the 10.30 service, we've handed over the reins fully to the FSM students, and that's no different for the main message. And, uh, and so we had five students preach for five minutes each at the 8.30, and now we've got a new set of five students preaching for five minutes each. So we've got five by five this morning. And uh, what I'd ask of you guys as the church is to encourage, uh, to clap, to be uh, very motivational for these guys uh, that are preaching for some of them, most of them actually their first time public speaking. And uh, it is not an easy thing, but we're so excited for what the Lord has poured into their lives. And uh, man, the the, five, the 8.30 was incredible. All five of them just shared and poured out their hearts. A little bit lighthearted. We've got a bit of a boxing bell round timer at the end of five minutes. Because how many know part of uh, leadership training is that you would stick to your time? And so just don't boo them when the, the bell comes on. And we're just going to encourage them uh, lightly, gently. But can we give it up for our five by five preachers this morning? <laughs> Who have we got first? Are you first? Hello, hello. Um, I'm Jeremy, by the way, if you guys don't know me. Um, nice to meet you all. Good morning. All right. My message today is called Find Me in the Wait. Now, I wanted to read Matthew 25, but I don't have enough time. So I'm going to paraphrase, right? So Matthew 25, it's the story of the bridesmaids. So 10 bachelorettes go to see Prince Charming, right? So they take with them their battery-powered torches, and five of them were wise enough, and they took extra batteries with them. Well, the other five didn't. Now, Prince Charming was taking so long, so they all took a nap. And at midnight, they were woken up by a phone alarm saying, Prince Charming is here, Prince Charming is here. So they all turned on their torches, but five of them didn't turn on. So they begged the others if they had any spare batteries, but they didn't. So they're like, go get your own, we got ours. So they went away and they got their uh, batteries, and while they were gone, Prince Charming came, and he gave them all roses who were there and invited them to his castle and locked the door. Later, the five arrived with their extra batteries, pleading at the door. But he was like, sorry, you do not get the final rose. All right, so when I was reading the story, I was thinking of, you know, the five foolish ones that didn't get extra batteries. I was like, why? Like, why didn't they get, bring extra batteries? Like, maybe they thought that the groom, was gonna, uh, that the groom wasn't gonna take so long. Maybe they took the bare minimum because they're busybodies and didn't expect the groom to take so long. You know, they're fitting Prince Charming's visit into their plans instead of allowing Prince Charming's visit to fit around their plans. Sorry, it's not Prince Charming. You should go read Matthew 25 after this. All right, so we can do the same thing with Jesus, right? We often get so busy with our day-to-day, -day, right? We worry about tomorrow, a project, an assignment, a TV show, social media. If That, that was Bachelor, by the way, if you guys didn't reference it. Um, but, um, you know, it gets us way too busy. So busy that we miss time to spend time with Jesus and we make excuses. Now I've got a story. So at the start of the year, uh, I decided to go rock climbing um, with one of my mates. Now my mate had been rock climbing before and he's physically fit. And there's me. Uh, I haven't gone climbing since I was 12. Um, so I was bad. I was, I was bad. I can say that, okay? So um, I'd climb and, you know, you'd fail from time to time. And, you know, I started to get my mate, like, really mad. Not because I was bad, it could have been, I don't know, but like, it's because I kept making excuses. Now, really bad excuses. Um, I'd say, oh, I just can't do it. I'm too tall. Or, you know, like, oh, like, oh, I'm just so tired. You know, I'm so exhausted. I'm not 18, I'm 22. Um, <laughs> really, really bad excuses, right? But, you know, when you're weak, you don't get better by making excuses. You face it head on. When you don't spend time with Jesus, don't make excuses about it. Go spend time with Him. It is time that we spend time with Jesus and find Him in the wait. Isaiah 40, 29 says this. He gives power to the weak, strength to the powerless. Sorry. Uh, even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall into exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar, on, soar high on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. In some translations, it says for, for those who wait on the Lord. And in my translation, we'll find new strength, which reminds me of the scriptures, Philippians 4, 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Not a little, not most, everything. 
We need to spend time. <laughs> you guys are wonderful. <laughs> we need to sp- spend time with Jesus in the secret place, and He will renew our strength. That looks like spending time alone with Jesus in prayer and worship and devotion, reading His Word, crying out to Him, whatever it looks like. We need to stop fitting God in our lives, but let our lives operate around Him. Let Jesus be the center of it all. We need to stop being the rush around impatient people who make excuses of not having time for Jesus. And we need to be an Isaiah 26, 8 people, which reads this. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth, we wait eagerly for you, for your name and your renown are the desire of our souls. Lord, may we find you on the wait. So I have titled my message, Holy Fear, Embracing a Life of Surrender and Freedom. Just keeping it light this morning. Grace was teaching at FSM one night and she encouraged us to read the New Testament with an Old Testament lens. And I was challenged by this because I didn't have an Old Testament lens. I remembered some of the stories from what I was taught in Sunday school, but that was as deep as it got. I started reading about the life of Moses, a man who was considered to be a friend of God. In Exodus 33:11, we read, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. The Lord knew that Moses would always choose God's heart over what looked best for him. Moses feared the Lord, obeying the voice of God no matter the personal cost. And so God revealed his plans and secrets to Moses. This is the kind of relationship I'm longing for and in pursuit of, to know the Father in such an intimate way that he shares his secrets with me. I realised that it's been pretty easy for me to love Jesus. How could you not? But I haven't necessarily feared God with a holy, reverent fear. I think it's important to note here that we're not talking about fear in a destructive sense, in the way you might fear an unknown future or the opinions of other people or what will happen with your finances. The kind of fear, that kind of fear ultimately leads to destruction. When you fear the Lord, which means you worship Him with reverence and awe, it is the beginning of everything good. Proverbs, three, five, three to five, Proverbs 2, 3 to 5 says, Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. What I'm learning about holy fear is that it keeps us connected to the wisdom of our Creator, the only one who knows what's best for us. As I'm beginning to grasp what it means to fear the Lord, my life is being transformed. It's been the beginning of an increased intimacy with the Father and a yearning to reach a point of full surrender. I was preparing to give this message at FSM a few weeks ago and I got down on my knees before the Lord and I asked him what was on his heart and to show me what's in my heart, and he did. Instantly I saw a picture. I was looking down at my feet. One foot rested on one side of a riverbank and the other foot was on the other side of the bank. I could see exactly where I was. I was at the Jordan River. Several years ago I actually traveled to Jordan and went to the place where Jesus was baptized. There's a few points in the Jordan River where it's so narrow that you can stand with one foot on each side of the bank. But on one side you're in Jordan and on the other side you're in Israel. When the Lord showed me this picture, I felt he was saying to me, your feet are still in two camps. I need your undivided heart. This terrified me. I don't feel that I'm divided and I'm genuinely trying to pursue a life of holiness But as I stayed in his presence, I became aware that there were still areas of my life where I was clinging on to the world, or at least a worldly way of thinking. These things were very subtle, but they've been preventing me from entering that next level of freedom and closeness with Jesus. How many of you know that repentance equals freedom? But it's not just about repentance. He's calling us to fully surrender. After I was baptised last year, there was a major shift in my behaviour and attitude. As a natural consequence of baptism, my colourful language cleaned up, literally overnight. I had no desire to touch alcohol, and just as the song says, the things of this world grew strangely dim. These changes in my life were obvious and actually came really easily. However, my insecurities, my deep fears and old patterns of thinking exposed my lack of holy fear in specific areas of my life. When we fear the Lord, even these subtle things can't exist. 
I was listening to Bill Johnson this week and he said, what you fear will ultimately dilute and infect your worship. You can't truly fear God and also fear the opinions of man. If I want to be called a friend of God like Moses, I have to give him full ownership of my life and it involves complete and ongoing surrender. We know we're in this... We know we're in this exciting season where God is pouring out His Spirit, refining His people and purifying His bride. And it's so beautiful, but it can be really hard sometimes. When you ask God to show you what's in your heart, He does. And some of it can be downright ugly. I'm sure I've shed more tears this year than I have in my entire life. But you know what? The joy of the Lord is my strength. A deep redemptive work has taken place over this last year, and I'm so thankful to be so lovingly corrected by my Father, because we know that this is where true freedom is found. When we humble ourselves before the Lord and know that without Him we can do nothing, this is where we can truly live in the fullness of His grace, empowered to live a life of holiness. The Lord has been gently exposing the lies that I've partnered with throughout my life, where I've justified my thoughts and behaviour based on my past experiences and he's replacing them with his truth. He continues to show me more of who I am and more of who he is. I belong to Jesus, and I've been sent by God for a specific purpose here on earth, as is the same for every single one of us. In James 4, we're reminded of the importance of humility, of resisting the temptations of the world and drawing near to God. It says, don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at um, at odds with God? So then surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will flee in agony. Move your heart closer and closer to God and He will come even closer to you. Be willing to be made low before the Lord and He will exalt you. Is your heart divided today between the world and your Creator? Are there lies from the enemy that you've partnered with that are robbing you of a deeper intimacy with Him? What are you carrying around that was never meant for you? I encourage you to seek what's on Yahweh's heart for you. Humble yourself before Him, revere Him and He will show you and He will set you free. Good morning, Freedom (laughs) Centre. My name is Maria, and I'm going to talk to you about knowing God personally. There's a saying we're all familiar with, and it's the saying that ignorance is bliss. What you don't know can't hurt you, right? Well, I'm here to tell you today that that's a lie. See, our friend, the prophet Hosea, in verses four to six, tells us this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He goes on to say, Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. That's a pretty powerful statement. So we have to ask ourselves, what is this knowledge? The Hebrew word for knowledge of understanding of God is yada, which means to know. It's personal knowledge. It's the kind of knowledge you can only get by being in an intimate relationship with someone. If we don't have knowledge, we can get led astray. In the case of Hosea, as many times before, the Israelites were doing evil in the Lord's sight. They're breaking the law of the Ten Commandments and still going to the temple. Everything God gives them, they give to false gods. They don't trust God and they look everywhere for answers except to the Most High. You can see how frustrating that would be for God. They have no personal knowledge of Him and they don't care. They think they can do whatever they want and it won't matter. They have been led astray. A few years ago, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, I was also led astray. I lacked my own personal knowledge of God. I had been having discussions with a good Christian friend about some issues we've been having at home. She gave me some crystals and some sage, suggesting I burn it around the house, referring to it as just another tool in the toolbox. Let me be very clear, this is someone I looked up to in spiritual matters because she had been a Christian longer than I had. She had many encounters with God, the spirit realm, read her Bible and went to church. Why wouldn't I listen to her? I listened because I was insecure because I didn't know the Lord for as long as she had. I had this insecurity inside that I would never catch up because I hadn't learnt the stuff from birth. 
I didn't feel like I heard from the Lord well enough and that she must have a better connection with him than me. I sought knowledge from other Christians who were more Christian than me rather than seeking knowledge through my own intimate relationship with God and knowledge of his holy word. While deeply suspicious of these crystals and incense, I ignored the voice saying, this isn't right. I also had other Christians tell me about the benefits of crystals. After all, God made them. I sat them with my Bible. I wasn't much of a Bible reader at the time, but I still knew that God has all the power. In the end, I couldn't ignore the voice. I threw them out. I sought more knowledge and I repented for even considering it. Friend, do not let yourself be deceived. The enemy knew that I doubted myself. He knew that I was intimidated by the faith of more Christian Christians and he tried to take me down a path that God didn't want me to go. Often we look to leaders or people of influence to give us clues on how we are to behave. We know that ultimately if those leaders are not carrying godly knowledge and walking righteously with the Lord, then they too are going to deceive many. If we go back to Hosea, we see that the priests were actually glad when the people sinned. And for what reason? Because the priests were able to eat from the sin offerings. How the priests behaved was how the people behaved. They exchanged the glory of God for the shame of idols. We must seek the Lord for ourselves. We cannot rely on others to do that for us. We don't want to walk so closely to the line of what would displease God because we don't actually know for ourselves. Let's be honest. The enemy may have a better knowledge of God than we do ourselves. For we know when Jesus talks about the future in Matthew 24, 12 to 13, that sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Don't rely on your pastor to be the only one who feeds you the Word of God. We wouldn't go to war without a weapon. Pick up your sword, that holy Bible, and get to know God. Pray in the secret place. Worship Him only. Be a person who seeks yada and experience God's love for yourself. It's this knowledge of God that transforms hearts and lives. Good morning, everyone. Uh, My name is Mark. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome listening to what God's doing in, in everyone's lives? It's just amazing. Hey, salvation is a free gift. We all know that. An amazing free gift of God. But it doesn't stop there. And, and Paul says in Philippians, I press on to, to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Every one of us has got a destiny in God. Every one of us, God wants us to, to, to advance further to, into all that he has for us. So I want to talk briefly today about the subject of preparation. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's just something that's been on my heart the last while. Uh, my reference scripture is Ephesians 10, um, uh, sorry, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 24. Now, I'm not going to read that just in the essence of time. A very well-known piece of scripture. Um, but essentially, it talks about... Um, that we, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and heavenly realms. And then it goes on from there to give us a very vivid picture of the armour of God in the form of a Roman soldier. All right? So a couple of things that I've picked up from that. The battle is not physical. We know that. The battle is not, although the, the Roman soldier is portrayed as physical, the battle is not physical. The Word tells us that we need to be strong in the Lord. We need to pick up the armour of God. We need to put on the armour of God. And it's the whole armour. It's not part of the armour. If we only take half the armour, we're exposed, right? We have to take the whole armour of God. And then the last thing that it really emphasises in the Scripture is that we need to stand. We need to stand, 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 right? Now, all these are actions on us. They're not actions on God. We need to to take up what God has given us, and we need to advance with that, right? So the Scripture to me, the structure of the Scripture is very interesting because it starts off talking about telling us who our enemy is, and then it talks about the armour. So if we put that into that context of how we need to view this, we need to view our enemy. Our enemy is defeated. We all know that. But sometimes we lose track of that, right? But more importantly, 
we need to know who we are in Christ, right? If we know who we are in Christ, we can adequately stand in that armour that we're given, right? So be strong in the Lord, put on that armour. And I want to focus on just one element of the armour, which sometimes gets overlooked. We all talk about the sword, we all talk about the shield, we talk about the breastplate. But what about the shoes, right? So this picture that we're given of this Roman soldier, if you think about it in Paul's time, the people that Paul would have been addressing would have had a very, very clear image of what he's talking about, right? The Roman soldiers were around them all the time, right? The area was occupied by the Roman Empire. They were a symbol of power and they were a symbol of authority within the, within the ranks of the people, right? Now, interestingly, if we took, if, when you look at a Roman soldier, they were all issued these various elements of their kit. One of the things that were issued was called Caligali. These are the shoes that the, the, the Roman soldiers wore. Essentially, they were fancy jandals, really, at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> But they were just made of leather, but they were bound onto the soldier's feet. So they'd be integral with enabling that, that soldier to stand, right? And I just want to focus a little bit on these Caligali, because it's actually a really interesting concept. When these shoes were issued to the soldier, they were pretty basic. The soldier then had to take these shoes, and he would take them, and they would hammer hobnails into the base of these shoes, right? Now, a hobnail is, a, is like a sprig on a, on, on a, on a, on a rugby boot. And they would take these little, these little nails made of um, brass or iron and they would hammer them into the base of these shoes. And it, the more they hammered into the base of the shoe, the better grip they had in the wet, the better grip they had to stand when the enemy came against them. But the emphasis here is that the soldier had to do the work, right? And it's exactly the same with us. That's a physical representation of a spiritual concept, right? We need to take those hobnails and we need to hammer them into our feet because the more we hammer in the more preparation we do the better we stand right so every time every time we go to an FSM class bang we're hammering in a nail every time we spin on our knees we're hammering in a nail every time we submit to the Lord surrender to the Lord we're hammering in nails that help us to stand when the enemy wants to take us right so just one more thing. I just want to focus on one more thing. These shoes were also weapons of war. They were actually weapons of war. When these Roman garrisons used to advance, they would actually march over the top of the enemy and they would literally crush the enemy under their feet, right? Very interesting concept. Because when you look in Romans 16, 20, Paul says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, right? Not Adam's feet or Grace's feet, your feet, my feet. Young people over there, your feet, right? We need to be prepared so that we can lay hold of that for which Christ lay hold of us. Amen. <laughs> Good job, Mark. Hard to come up next from that. But this morning, I'm gonna be talking about the peace, the power, and the ultimate interpreter. One of the many attributes of the Holy Spirit and the three I'm choosing to highlight are from a season in my life where I needed Him more than I've ever needed Him before. So kind of help that you need that can only come from the source, the Holy Spirit Himself. A day after Jet was born, four, four medical staff walked in very abruptly to our room and told us that Jet most likely had Down syndrome which you will hear me refer that as up, so there should be a photo coming. This was not expected at all. Is he not the cutest little boy? <laughs> this was not expected at all. This information rocked me to my absolute core. But what made this a hundred times worse is throughout the pregnancy, uh, sorry, what made this worse throughout the pregnancy, I developed the most debilitating anxiety that I've ever had. And it got worse as the days build up. Getting the diagnosis a day after birth was not only earth shattering in the moment, but because of the delivery and the interpretation of the diagnosis, it was made so much worse. I lost everything about me in that moment and started questioning God why. Two, week, two weeks went past of me sitting in this state, full of fear and really upset. But I called upon the Lord and this is where the Holy Spirit stepped in and changed my life. 
I needed something to grip onto to give me hope. And amongst all the information and the prognosis of his life and everything they said he wouldn't be able to do, I needed to find a source of hope, a foundation to step from. Um, And I couldn't get that from anyone or anything. I had to get it from the Lord. So the Holy Spirit in those moments to me was peace. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He is power, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then the ultimate interpreter, John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears and He will tell you what is yet to come. Again, 1 Corinthians 2.10. 2, 10. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. In the middle of the storm that we find ourselves in, His peace in the moment and throughout the storm gives us the strength to move forward in a powerful way. His power, which is made manifest in our weakness to push us through the storm, overcome, and His power allows us to see the situation the way Lord, the Lord sees it and not the way man sees it. The way the Holy Spirit interprets beautifully to Father God, prayers we don't even know how to shape into words and then presents it into a divine language to God, which interprets our intentions perfectly. I had a deep, deep desire for the Holy Spirit to come and interrupt my situation and reveal Himself in a way, in any way. Then, um, and then the peace, the power and the perfect interpreter came into my situation. One day in the maternity ward shower, I cried out to God, I asked Him all the why questions and I questioned my faith. Little did I know how amazing my life was about to become. Thankfully, I had the perfect interpretation of the Holy Spirit that intervened. Holy Spirit interpreted my prayers into a divine language to God, into a divine language to God the Father that shared my intentions perfectly. Because all my prayers were why, why me, why this, what now? But the Holy Spirit interpreted my intentions to Father God and shaped them into beautiful prayers. That day and amongst all the trauma and the fear, I I felt the Holy Spirit tell me Jet was gonna defy all the odds. And can I tell you now, He is. (laughs) With this perfect interpretation, it brought me peace. I had hope through the source, not just hope that's here for a moment and gone tomorrow, but I had a hope that would carry me throughout this journey and for the future the kind of hope that's foundational for every and any situation we face. Then came the walking out of the Word, continuing to believe even with everything discouraging they were speaking over Jet. I had to stand on the Word that God gave me and choose to believe that instead of the labels. It's worth getting heaven's perspective on your situation this morning because it's so much bigger, it sees so much more than what we see. Storms have come and storms have gone, but the power of God is fully steadfast, wow, and reliable. The power of the Holy Spirit got me through all the what ifs, the jet won't evers, the what next, the negative comments, the overwhelming emotion of what the future could look like. If my eyes are daily fixed on the author and the perfecter of my faith, if I'm calling on the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit, then I can't go wrong. It's when I step out of sight of that, that's when, uh, that's when anxiety comes. This is why we need to search out, to call out, to believe and call upon the perfect interpreter, the perfect peace and the perfect power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. We cannot let or allow the devil to steal what is rightfully ours. We have all access to Holy Spirit. As I close, no matter what storms in life have come at us all today, whether we've had a tough diagnosis or we're facing some hard realities, whatever it is, I know you too can have the perfect power, the perfect peace and the perfect interpreter. (sighs) He will intervene in your situation. Just call upon the Holy Spirit. He will guide us, He will love us and He will help us, Amen. Let's welcome our pastors. <laughs> How wonderful. Can we give it up for our five preachers? Man, so proud of all of you guys. So proud of what, uh, you know, the Word 
can do in a person's life. And I just want to encourage you as we close today, um, I'm just going to do a shameless plug for FSM. Um, you know, 15 years ago when I got saved, it was two months after I got saved that I started to see at Freedom Centre in the Melbourne location, uh, people that were getting trained up in the Word and raised up as leaders. And um, I was working at Melbourne Airport at the time, about to be promoted to supervisor of a, a particular wing of the airport. And um, heard about FSM and it was full time at the time, it was during the day, three days a week and a, a lot more than what, what these guys have to do. But the, 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 the strategy remained the same. I, I felt like I wanted to know this Jesus that, that, that set me apart and completely changed my life and I wanted to be trained up in the things of God. And so um, I, I, I made that decision. I went to my boss and he said, Adam, you got what, two options. You can, you can uh, pursue your career or you can become a priest. I said, okay, he's kind of half right. I said, well, handed him my resignation and full time for three years of study and a year of practical ministry. And can I tell you today, I wouldn't be able to lead this church uh, if had I not joined FSM, had I not spent that time in the Word of God, being trained up, being shaped, being moulded, being challenged, as you've heard today. Uh, there's something about the Word. It's, I love the program. I love what, we, what we've produced in FSM. But honestly, the textbook is the Bible. The textbook is the Word of God and there's no other book that can shape you, change you, mould you, renew your mind and, and, and develop you into the person that God has created you to be. And so um, our ministry school is only our ministry school because of the Word of God. And the teacher that gets invited into the classroom every single time is the Holy Ghost Himself. That's what He said. He said, I'm the teacher. And um, I want to encourage you that as we go into the end of the year, no matter what stage, age, you've seen different people, you've seen different stages of life. Some have been walking with the Lord for a long time. Some have just started walking with the Lord. But I want to encourage you today, if you've got like even a 5%, oh, should I do it next year? Sign up today. I want to put the challenge out to you. Don't wait till tomorrow. I'll have a think about it or a pray about it. I can tell you it's always God's will for you to study His Word. You don't need to search the will of God to find out whether you should come on a Wednesday night and study His Word. I can tell you right now, it is His will. And uh, I just wanna challenge you today. If you feel like you wanna, you gotta be 18, of course, um, but, but start that process. Get on the website, freedomcenter.nz, sign up. We have a whole bunch of students that are doing that. We're believing for 100 students next year. And uh, I, I, want, I wanna challenge you to that. I wanna challenge you to step up because this is what FSM produces. Fireball Revivalist. And that's, the, that's what you've seen on the back of the T-shirts, Raising Revivalist. That is the mission, that's the vision. And we would love to have you join next year. So I wanna put the challenge out to you today to come and join FSM as we come and we take this nation for Jesus, amen. Awesome, so good. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo that. I mean, we came to New Zealand not to plant a church, not to even lead a church, but to start a leadership school. And that's what really our heart burns for this because we need strong leaders to be able to affect the cities that we live in and the nation that we live in with the power of God. Um, and so sometimes I think that when we look at a ministry school, we think number one, that it's the leadership pipeline for that church. And it is. It is the leadership pipeline for this church. It is how we grow church planters and how we you know, spread out. And actually, if you wanna jump in on what God's doing here and you wanna be a part of it, then this is the, that's the pathway. But more than that, it's actually a place where we come to learn who God created us to be and how we live that out. Because sometimes we think that we go to a ministry school to learn how, to, how does a church operate? How do we run a service? How do we do a Sunday? And so we look at it with the, the lens of a Martha. So I'm gonna spend a year learning to be just like Martha who was busy in the kitchen making everything happen. But actually we get to be a Mary. Every week when we come and we sit at the feet of Jesus, we are being Mary in that moment. And we're saying, Lord, I wanna learn from You. I wanna be discipled by the Holy Spirit. I wanna sit at Your feet and I wanna set aside this time to do that. And can I tell you, there is a portion of anointing that God will pour out on your life when you make a sacrifice like that. So I just wanna encourage you and challenge you that if there's something in you, there's like a, an itch that you can't scratch. It's like, I know there's more for me in the Lord and I want something more than just coming to church on a Sunday. Come and do FSM. Sit at the feet of the teaching of Jesus every week and watch Him transform your life. So I just wanna commend all of these students. We are so incredibly proud of every single one of you. We love you all. Can we put our hands together for them one more time?